Hello. Welcome. This is episode two in the series Convergence. My name's Michael Doran. I'm a California attorney. I'm a California attorney who, just like anybody else, became very involved in the climate change debate about 25 years ago. I have a strong math and science background, and, uh, and the debate drew, drove it, the, including many experts and people who politicized it, people who were passionate about climate change. But in this particular case, something kind of came of that search. Albert Einstein said among the most difficult problems in all of physics is the Earth's magnetic field. As you're going to come to see, I believe it's among the most difficult problems in all of biology. And I think it's worth really talking about life in general and the most difficult problem that life faces. And that is, if there's no magnetic field, the solar winds, winds from space, will strip away the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, it becomes kind of like Mars, a dead planet. And Mars does have a magnetic field but its core solidified. And it's, when its core solidified, its magnetic field became a permanent magnet and very weak and not capable of holding its atmosphere. It was stripped away by solar winds and so forth. Soon it, it was brutally cold. And even though there's discussion about uh, putting people on the planet, it, it's going to be very difficult to have anything there without an atmosphere. Today, um, I want to talk a little bit uh, uh, specifically about one paper, but there needs to be a bit of a background why the Earth's magnetic field is very unique, particularly because of its moon. The moon, uh, at one time, was much closer to the Earth than it is now. Of course, uh, the moon is a result of a, of a crash between uh, uh, a much larger body than we have now, probably. And it broke off and it began to orbit around the Earth long before there was life and at a time when the Earth was still very hot from all the collisions. This is just textbook stuff. And, uh, but at the same time, convergence is occurring where we're learning more and more about the history of the Earth uh, as it formed in, in the early solar system. And uh, as the Earth and the Moon interacted, uh, the, the heat from the collision and then as well as the heat from the Moon rotating around the Earth caused a lot of friction inside the Earth and heat, and, um, and many of the, of the volcanic processes began at that time. And uh, the, the moon was so close, uh, it, 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 as you go back in time to the Earth, that tides were 50 feet high and uh, uh, very dramatic uh, lunar cycle, and that's the context that life first came into being. And uh, let me also segue a little bit more, in that if you have a planet like Jupiter, which has a red dot in it and um, uh, a giant storm that continues on and on and on, you could never have life form there. Uh, and that's because it's so extreme that the inputs to the system are such that there can't be a feedback to it. it you can't have a feedback and response that's living. Uh, it's just too uh, s strong a signal. So whenever you have an a, a input system like the Earth does, you want to have changes that are occurring on an on ongoing basis but not strong enough that the feedback can't contribute to it and produce stable conditions 
uh, just like when I'm hot, I sweat, or cold, I shiver, if my body's temperature starts to cook, I won't be able to sweat anymore. Or if it gets so cold that I'm no longer able to effectively shiver and warm myself up, uh, the feedbacks will not work if, if there's extremes involved. And it's kind of the same problem. And the, the moon is very unique in that small orbital changes in the moon can change not just the um, tides that we're used to thinking. And, and most people in the climate community are very tied into the ocean. They, they think about these couplings between air and ocean. And this is going to become very important in the discussion we're about to have. So, the year, in, in the year 2000, let me be really precise, I'm, I'm uh, holding from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, University of California, a paper contributed by Charles D. Keeling. Uh, it was published from pnas.org. And um, it was published on April 11, 2000. Very, very seminal paper uh, by two people, Charles D. Keeling and Timothy P. Warf. And uh, as I mentioned in the first show, there, there's been a sort of a, a stasis, an end to much change in the climate change de debate. And uh, you, you have people on the warmer side who just point outside and say, this is crazy what's going on, and see the CO2 is a greenhouse gas theory, and they say it's got to be that. And um, so-called skeptics who kind of say, well, we've already addressed it and won. And th there's a giant divide between the, the people who, who debate climate change. This paper that came out in 2000 was right on the, on the end of this. And it's, it's an incredible paper because by history, Charles Keeling was the person who missed the kids, his children's birth by being on a volcano mountain in the Hawaiian Islands with this measuring station of CO2. He wrote books about uh, rising CO2. He's probably one of the most famous people in this arena. And he's famous for showing how over time uh, CO2 has gone uh, way up and, and every year goes up a little bit from that m monitoring station in the Hawaiian Islands. And it's up on a volcano so that it can't be, uh, it, you get a global average because it's not, there's no mixing from cars or anything around it. And Timothy Wharf was an expert on the moon of all things. Just like I was talking about the moon uh, produced these giant tides. And th this paper that they wrote is called The 1800 Year Oceanic Tidal Cycle, a Possible Cause of Ripe, Rapid Climate Change. And the, the uh, in bold uh, sort of synopsis of the paper, uh, and, and again, this is from Scripps, which is a oceanography so it's very, it says, this is in the bold of the paper, variations in solar radiance are widely believed to explain climactic change on a 20 to 100,000 year time scales uh, in accordance with the Milanovic theory of the ice ages. But there's no conclusive evidence that variable irradiance can be the cause of abrupt fluctuations in cli climate on time scales as short as 1,000 years. We propose that such abrupt millennial changes seen in ice and sedimentary core records were produced in part as well as characterized almost periodic variations in the strength of the global oceanic tide raising forces caused by resonances in the periodic motions of the moon and the earth. A well-defined 1800 year tidal cycle is associated with gradually shifting lunar declination from one episode of maximum tidal forcing on the centennial time scale to the next. An amplitude modulation of this cycle occurs 
with an average period of about 5,000 years associated with gradually shifting separation intervals between the Fihelian and the Zygzni at maximum of the 1800 year cycle. We propose that strong tidal forcing causes cooling at the surface by increasing the vertical mixing of the ocean. On the millennial time scale, this tidal hypothesis is supported by findings from sedimentary, sedimentary records of ice rafting debris that ocean waters cool close to times predicted for strong tidal forcing. Okay, I disagree with the conclusion of mechanism, but I agree 100% with their findings of that there's a climate signal here and it's associated with the moon. And, and just why the moon is causing this, I, I completely disagree with them. And this is the point, whole point of technologies converting. I think they were doing a lot of speculating about tidal overturn as being a cause. Because when we think about the moon, that's what we think about. But um, the, the mechanism, I believe, is different. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about in, in light of this paper. So what is the mechanism that I'm talking about? Well, the assumptions that I'm making have to do with the fact that we're here, that life exists and life, life came to be. Uh, life is, is, uh, is the proof in and of itself that some sort of process had to deal with all the different inputs that come into the system, including uh, changes in the moon's orbit. Uh, the best short way of explaining it that I've heard is this idea of implausible complexity. So let's give an example of that. Say we're talking about oxygen. In the atmosphere, the oxygen levels are around 20%, a little over 20%. And if the oxygen levels rose to a level that, were, that was higher than 20% or whatever the specific percent is, um, you would see forest burning. You would see all kinds of catastrophic things occurring to life. And on the contrary end of it, if oxygen levels were too low, we would all suffocate. And yet over time we see, over not just 10 years, 15, over huge long time scales, no matter what the inputs that we're talking about, whether it's the moon or whether it's solar variants, uh, whether it's um, the Milanovitch cycle that they're talking about, which is incoming solar radiation, which which varies by how how much of an ellipse Earth is, how it's tilted, uh, and the, the precession of the equinox. It's like a top moving around. All these different things vary how much light the, the is incoming to the climate system, and for longer periods of time. Scientists are pretty comfortable in saying that the Milanovitch cycle starts these ice ages. So this paper is addressing these shorter term fluctuations that we're seeing in the rec record that don't have anything to do with changes in solar output. That's, an, that's for another show. Um, and, uh, and so what they're saying here is that the, the moon's tides, depending upon how the, the orbit of the moon is occurring, change, and they change in such a way so that they are overturning the warm water on top of the thermal haline, and, um, and, and it exposes colder water, and then it, it, it changes the temperature and causes these cycles that are seen really in the climate record. Uh, it's a great paper to review. Uh, get online and it's 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 online for anybody to see uh, I, I just did to find it I just searched Keeling Wharf and moon those three words and it just came right up so that's what their theory is here's what the problem with that is let's say you have a moon come by and it overturns the tide 
and it exposes this colder water, uh, then what? It's, it's over with, right? The event is done and shouldn't the ocean warm up? It's too abrupt to have an ongoing continuous change. But there's something that certainly uh, was, and, and, and I believe we're going to, as we go fur further with this, uh, you'll see that uh, it's quite clear what the real cause of this is. And that is, just like when you rub your hands together, you feel a little bit of warmth from the friction. When the moon goes around the earth, it causes friction inside. It also causes stresses and, and movements uh, underneath the, there's tides basically of the rock, tides of the earth itself, it's moving. And that movement causes a change in the rock, basically. And that change in the rock is going to have conductivity meaning. It's going to have electrical meaning. It's going to affect the global electric circuit. The mechanism that I've been talking about, or that I'm going to be talking about, is electrical. It's looking at carbon dioxide not as a greenhouse gas, although it has a chaotic, another chaotic input or an input into the climate system. It's not the part that dampens climate. The part that dampens climate has to do with, has to do with carbon dioxide in cloud droplets as they super cool to ice in the context of large-scale, low-frequency electromagnetic waves. And so changes in the conductivity of the Earth itself over time is going to have changes to climate because it changes how clouds behave, which it, clouds behave, behaviors is the main driver. Clouds will have both a, a static effect in terms of how much heat uh, escapes out into space or is trapped, uh, the greenhouse gas effect, and it will also have a dynamic effect in terms of how air is moved, compresses, um, uh, just like a bicycle tire, if you pump it up, it's going to warm up that tire. So, and, and this occurs not just in the tropics, but also it occurs all over the Earth. So how does it work? What's the mechanism here we're talking about? Well, it has to do with CO2, not as a greenhouse gas, but its behavior is dissolved in water. And we're all carbon uh, life for this very reason. What happens is surface lows will move along the ocean and just like shaking up a, a, a bottle of beer or a soda, the winds and the low pressure will decarbonate that ocean and the carbonation goes into clouds. And that becomes very significant because you can get a signal out of, of, out of the oceans. There's been studies specifically on Hurricane Felix in 2001. Scientists were trying to understand the carbon cycle, and Bates et al. looked at Felix uh, out of Harvard, and uh, they measured the ocean, and they saw that when the hurricane went over the ocean, about a third of its carbonation left the ocean. Well, where does that carbonation go? It goes into the clouds. It goes, goes into the clouds in a context of electrical currents from the global electric circuit moving around and forming a capacitive coupling over the storm. Positive on the ocean, uh, negative in between the bands and so forth. You get electrical organizations and that begins to affect cloud microphysics. And specifically, carbonation can be carbolic or carbonic acid in a droplet. And what happens is, is that droplet is starting to freeze. Instead of having a random freezing uh, shape to the, the ice crystals, it starts having um, stretched out or elongated or distorted uh, uh, structures. And the, the distortion is enough to change the freeze rates. And changing the freeze rates is enough to begin to affect cloud microphysics. 
and then how a storm organizes and how it stacks. So CO2, its, its beginnings had to do with modulating or dampening the Earth's magnetic field. And where life gets involved, DNA, RNA, R and acid, D and acid, is in the form of nucleotides also dissolved along with the carbonation that again affects the freeze rates, affects water feedbacks, and specifically, uh, DNA is unique in that it can be both a model and a feedback. So even before there were cells, even before there was life, that we, the way we think of it, just bare naked nucleotides in droplets form this symbiotic relation with carbon dioxide, which is why we're carbon life. We're DNA life and we're carbon life. And if it became part of a solution set to solve the Earth's magnetic field, then it was, was retained and replicated. If not, it was destroyed, destroyed in UV light and, and was not part of the solution set and then passed on and calculated and became more complex and more complex. And eventually we had cells and all of us. There was a very interesting computer chess game that occurred about the same time as this paper between Kasparov and Big Blue, which is an IBM supercomputer. And Kasparov actually beat the supercomputer, Big Blue. He tied with it several times, lost to it, but he beat the supercomputer. And he explained that he understood the programming of the computer, which is how he was able to beat it. So the computer, it doesn't play with the strategy like, uh, like you and I would to, to checkmate the king. What the computer does is it says, a rook is worth five points, a bishop is worth two and a half, a horse is worth two and a half, a queen is worth ten. As a pawn gets closer to the end line, it's, it's worth more. Uh, and, and there's different levels of sophistication. And it can do all kinds of almost infinite calculations. But it, it's not able to capture game strategy. And Kasparov, a, a brilliant chess player who studied the game, new strategy and, and was able then to therefore defeat it or give the computer a game. Me, I, I ended my computer play with Pentiums and then they just basically kicked my butt. But uh, the, the point is, is that we have a very similar problem today with life. And that is, as we're trying to live within life and form policy that makes sense to how to react to a living earth, as opposed to, you know, stopping fossil fuels or so forth. Um, we have to understand what the basic programming for life is and, and therefore be able to play and, and be stewards of the planet uh, rather than what we're doing right now. So back to this paper. Um, a couple of things that I just found really fascinating uh, in, in terms of uh, some of the things that it was saying. One, it, it looked at a, a lake in, in Minnesota, which is where I was raised. Uh, figure six, thousands of bar of years, K-Y-R, before 1980. And it shows three signals uh, in the paper, uh, one about 4,000 years ago, one about five, close between, mostly towards 6,000 years ago, and then another one 7.8 thousand years ago uh, of a lake called Elk Lake in Minnesota, which is very near uh, Lake Itasca. Lake Itasca is the source river, or it's, claim, uh, it, it's famous for being the source river uh, lake. I'm sorry. It's famous for being the source lake of the, pardon me, Mississippi River. And... Um, and what's unique about Minnesota is when the glaciers came through uh, and melted, they had cleared the land mostly to granite, which is uh, uh, not conductive at all. It's some of the most non-conductive land um, in the United States. 
and it, it's um, it's the scene of three river basins. One river basin is the Mississippi, and it drains down to the Gulf of Mexico. One is the Great Lakes, and it goes to uh, the Atlantic, and then Lake of the Woods, the Boundary Waters, a, a lot of the river system along uh, the Dakotas. That all drains to Hudson Bay. And the electrical resonances and currents that I'm talking about are large-scale, low-frequency. They're really big waves, and they need big antennas to be interesting to them. And the, these river systems are big enough. And right in the middle of these, what are three giant antennas, is Minnesota and a lot of lakes, 10,000 lakes, very famous for its lake. And this particular lake that the study was looking at showed this signal that matches these moon cycles. And f between 4,000 years uh, and now, the signal is much less dramatic, uh, certainly in Minnesota. Um, I believe that's because uh, th there's been further dampening of, of the climate uh, system through El Nino, which has been like clockwork for uh, two to five years, for the last 5,000 years, per coring studies of the lake in Ecuador. Between 4,000 years and 11,000 years, the El Nino occurred every 17 years, um, and, and, and the, from that date back, there's just not much uh, of a signal. Certainly in the glacial age, there is, uh, during the Wisconsinian, there's no uh, El Nino signal. We're talking about a dampening, uh, a system that dampens uh, in electrical inputs, things like uh, cosmic rays, solar weather, um, whether there's x-rays or whether there's solar winds. These are things that, in the absence of life, and in the absence of a dampening system, the magnetic field would become random, and then you would get no atmosphere, either way, or too much atmosphere. Either way, life would go. And to have it perfectly, the Earth's magnetic field, where it is, it's an implausible complexity to happen randomly. It's not happening randomly. Life is stepping in and causing what we're seeing. And so this paper was dramatic because uh, it started to introduce CO2 by basically the, the, the person who started the whole trend of looking at CO2 as a greenhouse gas. And there was a paper, actually quite political paper, between him um, from Scripps uh, and Mr. Uh, probably a Professor Wharf, Timothy Wharf, uh, and introduce another variable into it that CO2 didn't seem to explain very well. Um, but I say it does. It's because the mechanism for CO2 is much different. One more final thought before uh, I, f I finish this show for the day. Um, Keeling and Worf passed away a short time after this paper and both a short time from each other. And as political as these um, these papers are, I, I, I can't explain why they passed away so close. Maybe it was their, their dying, um, their dying contribution to mankind to uh, talk about more than just CO2 as a greenhouse gas, but start to get into the complexities. And this is, uh, this touched all the problems that are going on with the, with the debate right now, um, particularly the coupling between ocean and air, uh, introduction of inputs like the moon, um, and uh, these cycles that we're seeing that aren't caused whatsoever by the amount of incoming solar light, uh, or the so-called Milanovic cycle. Um, I wish you good luck, and uh, thank you. Please hit the like button, and have a great day.